What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that we are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ Je into Jesus Christ were, were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ were, was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we, should, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall uh, be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the you know, body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is death is freed from sin. Many of you are studying the book of Romans. It's a beautiful book, and it sets forth the plan of God's salvation more thoroughly than any other book in all the Bible, so it's a very important book for God's people. It not only teaches us many beautiful concepts, the book of Romans is also very comforting and very edifying for the people of God. Anytime we look at the book in the Bible, one thing that can help us to understand the individual verses in that book is to understand the overall plan of the book. To simply turn to a passage and try to understand it is rather difficult to do. We need to understand the purpose of the book and the plan of the entire book before we begin to look at individual sections of the book. Before we can understand individual verses in the book of Romans, we have to understand the entire book itself. We have to have an understanding of how the entire book fits together and how the arguments so intricately fit together and teach such beautiful lessons. And that's what I would like for us to do briefly is to look at that this morning. If you'll look in chapter 1, in chapter 1, verse number 1, we have the author of the book, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, a servant of Christ, called to the gospel. The word servant in verse number 1. The word servant means slave. Paul had been a slave to sin. But now we learn in verse number 1, this apostle called by God is a slave to Christ. He explained that in Galatians 2.20 when he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In Galatians 6, verse number 14, he said, I am crucified unto the world, and the world is crucified unto me. He had become a slave to Christ. This should be true of every Christian. Romans 6, verse 17. God be thanked, you were the servants of sin. That's the word slave. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. We were slaves of sin, Romans 6, 17. But now that we have obeyed the gospel... Now we must understand we are now the slaves of righteousness, the slaves of Jesus Christ. Paul did some horrible things in his life, thinking that he was right. But now those things have been forgiven. He has become a Christian. He has begun a new life, and now he is a slave to Christ. In Romans 1, verse number 1, and verse number 7, we learn that he's writing to those who have been called by God. We are called by the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse number 14. He writes to those who have been called to be saints. Sanctified, set apart. God calls us to be different from all the rest of the world. And Paul writes to those people in the city of Rome, verse number 7. In Romans 1, verse number 16, we have the theme of the entire book. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation unto everyone that believeth unto the Jew first 
and also unto the Greek. For therein is revealed the righteousness of God from faith to faith, as written, the just shall live by faith. Then in verse number 18, all the way through verse number 34, 32, we have the most ugly list of sins in perhaps all the New Testament Scriptures. Who is Paul describing? You must understand Paul is describing the world of his day. The world in which he had to live. He is describing the Gentile world of his day. And it was full of bitterness and gossip and prejudice and backbiting and hatred and murder and fornication and homosexuality. It was a world of sin. And Paul explains that very clearly in Romans chapter 1 verse 18 through 32. Then in chapter 2 verse 1, he said, Thou art inexcusable, O man. Who is he talking to? Notice what he says. You judge another, and in judging another, you condemn yourself. Why? Because you are doing the same things that you are judging other people for doing. He said you're inexcusable. Now in verse 21 and following, he makes it even more clear. Thou that teaches another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, does thou steal? Thou that says a man should not commit adultery, does thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, does thou commit sacrilege? Sacrilege is to rob temples. So Paul says in Romans chapter 2 that the Jewish people are also condemned as well as the Gentiles in chapter 1 because what they are condemning the world for doing, they are doing the same thing. Thus they had brought blasphemy against the name of God and Paul explains, you're inexcusable. Romans 2, verse number 1 and following. Then in chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, Paul explains, all are under sin. Who is all? Jew and Gentile. If you're not a Gentile, you're a Jew. Two kind of people in the world. Jewish people, Gentile people. If you're not a Jewish person, you're a Gentile person. And Paul explains in Romans 3, verse 9 and 10, the conclusion of Scripture is clear. Both Jew and Gentile, they are all under sin. Then in verse number 10, he said, There is none that's righteous. No, not one. Not one of us can stand before God and say, I deserve to have heaven. Not one of us can stand before our God on that great judgment day and say, I have earned it. I've been to church three times a week all my life. I've been through the five, worship, five acts of worship. I've done all those things. Now you owe me heaven. Not one of us could do that. Because Romans 3.23 explains, All have sinned and come short of God's glory. Every one of us have fallen short. Every single one of us in this room who are accountable to God, we have fallen short. We're not what we should be. We're not what we could be. Every one of us could be a lot better. Every one of us have fallen short. Therefore, none of us deserve eternal life. All of us deserve God's punishment. So what we have in the first three chapters, 
Paul is setting us up to understand how desperately each one of us needs the gospel. Chapter 1, the Gentiles are lost. Chapter 2, the Jews are lost. Chapter 3, all of us are lost. Therefore, these first three chapters set us up to cause us to understand how badly we need the gospel plan of salvation. Because every single one of us are lost. Chapter 4, Paul gives us a beautiful example of Abraham. Abraham is used all through the Bible to teach many beautiful lessons to God's people, but here in this chapter he is used to teach us a lesson on faith. No doubt we're saved by faith. No question there. The question is, what kind of faith saves us? And chapter 4 shows us. It doesn't just tell us, it shows us. Look at his entire life. Completely dedicated to God. That's faith. Not just going through religious acts. Not just coming to church. Not just saying, I believe the Bible. Not just believing certain doctrinal elements not just going to certain lectureships. No, it's an entire life given completely to God. An entire life that's dedicated to the service of Almighty God. Abraham is the example. Then notice verse 12. What's he say? All of us who are Christians, who are God's people, we walk in the steps of the faith of Abraham. Dedication. Commitment. Trust. Handing one's life over to the care of Almighty God. Loving others as God loved the world. All of that is involved in our faith. Compassion. Mercy. Just being sound in doctrine and having no compassion, that's not faith. Faith includes all of these beautiful elements, and we must walk in the steps of the faith of Abraham. Romans 4, verse number 12. Chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, notice verse 1. Romans chapter 5, look at verse 1. Therefore being justified by faith. Now he's already explained to us in chapter 4 what he means by faith. Doesn't mean just believing the right things, just checking off the little list. He doesn't mean that. He means not only believing the right things, but giving your entire life to God. He's explained that in chapter 4. So in chapter 5, when he says, therefore being justified by faith, we know what he means by faith because he explained that in chapter 4. Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. To be justified means for God to look upon us as if we were just, even though none of us are just because all of us are sinned. All of us have sinned. Therefore, none of us are really just. But being justified by faith, God looks upon us as if we were just. Then he explains what is behind all this beautiful plan in verse number 6. Romans 5 verse 6. When we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9, much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him, all based on the beautiful love of God. 
What does all of this mean? Look in chapter 6. What does it mean to be justified by faith? The Methodist Church, the Baptist Church, denominational churches teach it means the moment you believe in Jesus, you're saved. That's not what the New Testament teaches concerning faith. What does it mean to be justified by faith? Romans 6, verse 1. What do we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should no longer serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin, Who's freed from sin in verse 7? Romans 6, 7. Who has been freed from sin? Those who just say, I accept Jesus. No. No. Romans 6, 7. Those who have been freed from sin are those who have died. Who are those who have died? He's not talking about physical death. You will go back to Romans 6, 3 through 5. He's talking about those who have died with Christ in the act of baptism. In that beautiful act of faith, we died to the old man of sin. He was destroyed. He was buried. And in verse 5, we were raised up to walk in newness of life. Verse 17, God be thanked. Romans 6, 17, you were servants of sin, but you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you then being made free from sin you became the servants of righteousness in chapter 7 Paul discusses the relation of the Christian to law law by itself can save no one because law simply points out our flaws just like a mirror Law shows us where we are wrong. It cannot save us. And he gives this illustration in Romans 7, 1 through 4 about a lady who is married. He says she is bound by the law of her husband as long as he is alive. But if he dies and she marries another man, she's free from that law. But if while her husband be alive, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. Then he explains the point in verse number 7. We are dead to the law by the body of Christ, that we should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Romans 7 verse 4 God's people are not bound by that Mosaic law. We are joined to Jesus Christ. And we have a new life. What law is he talking about here? Is he just talking about the sacrifices and the burning of incense? No, he's not only talking about that. For in verse 6 and 7, he said, I would not have known sin except the law said. I would not have known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. What law said, Thou shalt not covet? Even these little children can tell you. Well, that's one of the Ten Commandments. Yes, it is. We are not bound by the Ten Commandments. We have God's people died to that law. The Jewish people, the Gentile people, were never under that law. 
but the Jewish people were, and they died to that law in Romans 7, 4, through Jesus Christ. Chapter 8. Chapter 7 presents a dilemma. Notice verse 24. O oh, wretched man that I am. You look at all the beautiful writings of Paul. He's not talking about when he's a Christian. He's not saying when he's a Christian he's a wretched man. Think about it. He would never say that. He's talking about a person under the law. No one could keep it perfectly. Therefore, no one could be justified by the Mosaic law. Therefore, Paul is using an illustration and showing what it's like to be under that law. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? It was death because everyone sinned. And everyone who sinned deserved death. Who shall deliver me? Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then you go right into chapter 8. No chapter and verse divisions in the original. We'll put those in for, for convenience. Now it's different. There is therefore now. See the word now in Romans 8, 1? Now he's not under the Mosaic law. Now he's not under condemnation as he was in chapter 7, verse 24. Verse 25, he's been delivered. Romans 8, 1 says, Now I'm delivered. There's therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For the law of the body for the law of the Spirit of life has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh condemned sin in the flesh. So He begins to tell us in Romans 8 how wonderful it is to be a Christian. Blessings in Christ. Notice verse 18. I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Think about that. All the sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared with all of the glory that's going to be revealed in us. Are you suffering today? Are you hurting are you in tribulation? Notice what the Bible says in Romans 8, 18. All the sufferings of this present time cannot even be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. In verse number 28, Paul says, I know that all things work together for good to those who are the called for those who love God. All things work together for good to those who are the call. That doesn't mean everything that happens in your life is good. Bad things happen in life. Evil people get guns and shoot people. That's not good. People get cancer and all kinds of diseases. That's not a good thing. But what did he say? All things work together for good to those who are the called. To those who love God. You look about at the world. What a mess. What a mess. And you honestly believe that we're going to elect someone who's going to straighten all this out. What world are you in 
you must be on the mothership. There isn't a person on earth who could straighten this mess out. It is a mess. And no elected official is going to be able to do it. It's in too big a mess. You look about not only at the world, but you look at the church, God's people. We're divided over some of the most foolish things. The unity we should have has surpassed us. Even among God's people, it's not like it should be. So you look about at the world and you look about at all religion and you wonder. But then you look at Romans 8, 31. Paul looked about at the world. He knew all the problems the church had in the first century. We don't have any problems they didn't have. He looked about at all that too. And you know what he said? What do we say to all these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Do God's people believe that anymore? When we look at the church, do all we see is her problems? Do all we see when we look at the church, well, this isn't right, this isn't right, this isn't right, this isn't right. Is that all we see? That's not what Paul saw. And he knew about all those problems more than we know. And this is what he says. Here's what we say to all these things. If God be for us, who can be against us? Is God for you? Is God for you? Well, everybody wants to say, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, how many people do you hear saying, God's against me? I don't hear anybody saying that. Even the people in prison who have committed heinous murders, they don't usually say that. Is God for you? I want to tell you something. If you've never obeyed His gospel, He's against you. Because all of your sins are right there. And He'll have no fellowship with that. But through His Son, Jesus Christ, you can repent of those sins and be immersed, and all of those sins can be forgiven. Then you can say, God is for me. Would you obey Him now?